Okay, welcome. I'd just like to welcome everyone to uh, the Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge. I'm the host of uh, Football Network World's weekly discussions with football practitioners from around the world. Um, today we're, we're discussing uh, um, creating opportunities for academy players release during, during the lockdown period. Um, before I introduce you to this evening's panel, um, let me just let you know how you can join in at home uh, with your questions and opinions for everyone on the panel. So we're going to set up the session as a session of two halves. Um, in the first part, we're going to be sort of dis discussing and sort of focusing on the, the situation with the players, sort of topics around the moment of being released and then how they've been able to find a new pathway during, during the lockdown period. So if you could use the Q&A tab on your, on your Zoom screen. Um, in the first instance, just to sort of focus your questions in and around, you know, what's been going on around the, with the players. And then um, partway through, we'll sort of have Sarah Murray from Brighton, Brighton sports psychologist uh, joining us. Um, and then we'll start to focus more on, on the situation with the clubs and, and, uh, and how they see themselves progressing as we move into this post-lockdown and the opportunities that they're going to be able to start giving to players. And again, if you start then filtering your questions in on, uh, on what's going on with the clubs themselves, then we'll get through as many as them as we can. Um, so, let's hope we can do that. Let me start introducing you uh, to our guests. Um, so, firstly, I'll start with Sam Ajus. Sam, how are you? Not too bad, thank you. You? Yes, yes, very well, very well. Um, Sam, I think, uh, yeah, firstly, just introduce yourself in terms of a little bit about your, your pathway in football and um, sort of up to where you are at this moment in time. Yeah, okay, so um, I was at Derby from the age of 12. Um, all the way until my scholarship uh, under 16s. Um, got told, unfortunately, I won't be receiving my scholarship at Derby. Uh, moved on to various clubs, trialling all around England. Uh, eventually went to Shrewsbury. Spent the past two years in Shrewsbury. Uh, lived up there in my digs. And then, unfortunately, about a month ago now, received the news, unfortunately, I won't be getting a, a professional contract. So now I'm just in the limbo, really, of what to do next. Okay, thank you, Sam. Um, secondly, uh, Derek Langley. Good evening to you, Derek. Good evening, Steve. Um, yeah, I'll just uh, quickly go through my, my role at the present. Um, obviously, previously, I was a main youth scout at Blackburn Rovers for 15 years, uh, and then being a Manchester boy, uh, moved to Manchester United for the following 16 plus years. Uh, where I became head of recruitment there at Manchester United. And then basically four years ago now, I decided uh, I'd travelled enough of the world, got enough air miles in, and decided to take a, a you know more of a consultancy role and uh, recruitment consultancy to, uh, to one of my ex-players. Um, so I'm basically advising Omnisport, who, uh, who I'm basically the head of recruitment for now. Right, brilliant, thanks. Cheers, Derek. It's good to have you with us. Um, Thank you. Let's move on to Alex Carroll. Alex is a Academy Director at QPR. How are you? How are you, Alex? Very good, Stephen. How are you? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Very well. Very well, thanks. Um, so, yeah, again, if you could sort of tell us a little bit of your, your background and, and up to your, your current role at QPR. Yeah, thanks. So, um, so uh, currently Academy Director at QPR. Um, I've been in this position for two and a half years um, and been at the club for six and a half years. I did a couple of different um, positions in the academy prior to, to becoming academy director. Um, career started at, at Tottenham Hotspur, um, working in the club secretary's department. So my background has always been sort of in the operational side of the game um, and spent uh, five years full time there before uh, joining up uh, with Queen's Park Rangers. Okay, thank you, uh, Alex. Uh, and finally, we have um, Peter Taylor. It's good to see you, Peter. Good to see you, Steve. Hope everyone's well. I'm, um, I've been at West Brom since I was about 12 years old. And at 16, I got offered my scholarship, which was good. Completed my two-year scholarship. Got um, offered a third-year scholar, where it 
for this season and unfortunately I got told about a month ago that I wasn't going to get offered a, a new deal. So I'm in the I'm in the boat of trying to find a new club and my, one of the main decisions for me is if I want to be playing under 23s slash reserves football next season at, at a league side or to be going lower down maybe conference and then playing first team. So that's where I'm at. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, you will uh, sort of to begin with. Then we're going to sort of focus on on the players. Um, I'll sort of take it back to to Sam. Um, Sam, I think you just, could you tell us a little bit about about um, when when you were released by by Shrewsbury, how how that came about, and and sort of your reaction to that. Yeah, so it was about a month ago now, probably. Um, we got told in our group chat that we'd all be having Zoom calls with the manager and the academy manager um, and all the times got put in. Um, so we all had them individually and the lads are coming through, receiving the news, letting, letting each other know and then my turn comes up and I go in there and they just said to us like really, unfortunately in these times now, we don't want to be taking you in and just being like a, a training keeper really. They said what you're for your development, we feel it'd be better if, say, you go now um, and try and find regular football, whether that be men's football or playing 23s. But they said, if you really, if you were to come to us now, you'd be more of a training keeper. We don't want to hold you back in that sense. Um, and then ever since that, really, whoever I've been talking to has been telling me, really, gaining men's experience is probably more important than, say, going back into a 23 side or something. They said it's okay to hide behind the blanket of going back into a professional environment. But they said what you all have in them years of playing men's experience will be much more valuable than saying just playing 23s, really. Um, so, yeah, it was on a, so you were released on a Zoom call sort of in yeah, the middle of It was of just the in, the middle, in, the, uh, in the middle of the lockdown, really, yeah. And it was just kept nice and sure, and then that was it. We were just left to our own device after that, really. Was this something you were, so you asked first, one, is this something you were expecting, and how did that moment of being released, how did that compare to when you were released by Derby? Um, I mean, to be fair, we all, like, when, it, when the first lockdown happened, we all joked about the fact that maybe we'd actually find out on, say, a a video call or something because we just thought it would that it would never get to that point where we'd not be able to see him face to face. Um, so it was kind of like in the end, we, we grew to realise that's actually how it would happen. But this one, Shrewsbury wasn't as bad as Derby because I kind of already experienced that kind of rejection. And with Derby, I, I really thought I was going to get my uh, scholarship with them. And I put everything into it and I thought, you know, this, this is going to happen. And then that rejection was kind of hard at the time, really. But it put me in better stead for if it was to come back around again. I kind of knew ways to deal with it, really. I knew that there was always a second option or something if I worked hard enough to come out of it again. So I felt like with Shrewsbury, yeah, it was a big disappointment at the time. But after a week or two weeks of getting myself back together. I was ready to just go again, really. and ready to put that aside. Know that it was a good experience then past two years. I had a great time there. Had some amazing experiences, but I'm ready to move on now and try and experience something else. Okay, we'll dig a little bit deeper into sort of how you've, how you've coped with uh, being released in a moment. So do I sort of move it on to, to Peter and sort of see how, how your situation compares to Sam. I mean, when, when were you told that you were being released by West Brom? Yeah, so I was told a few weeks before the lockdown started. So I was told in person. But um, yeah, it was really out of the blue. We were just, we thought we were just getting our six week reviews. So we were all just getting called in one by one into a meeting room. Then um, one of my teammates, a few meetings before we got released, and then it was like, oh, okay, this is, this is what's happening. So, uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, I went into my meeting, got told they're not going to offer me a new deal. And, um, of course, at the time, you, your first reaction is you're disappointed, of course. But for me, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a shock because of how the season's gone. It hasn't been the best season for me. So 
So it didn't come as a massive shock, which I suppose is good. But um, yeah, so ever since I've not like dwelled on it, I've not I've not um, looked back on it. But at at the time, of, of course, you're disappointed. That's your natural reaction. So you say it wasn't a shock, but it it wasn't the meeting you was expecting you was walking into. There hadn't been sort of any preparation for that whatsoever. Yeah, and no, I just had my video clips ready for for a six week review just to discuss how I thought I'd done the last six weeks, and then to get told that, yeah, I suppose that bit was a shock. But the fact that I had actually not been offered a new contract was wasn't a shock because of how the season had gone. Okay, we could bring uh, Alex in uh, at that point. I mean, sort of hearing Sam and Peter's experiences and how they were released. I just wonder what your first initial reactions were were to, to hearing that. It's tough. I think a release in any form for any player is, is obviously a very, very difficult moment. It's, it's a challenge enough to be on the other side of the table having to deliver the news, but, um, you know, I completely appreciate it and sympathise with how difficult it can be to, to receive it. Um, we were fortunate uh, in this situation that um, all of the boys uh, that are in sort of Sam and Peter's um, age group at our academy were either being retained or, or there was a couple of boys that had uh, gained scholarships at American colleges um, and had got offers prior to, to lockdown as well. So we had, we had already um, confirmed everyone's situation prior to lockdown so thankfully for us we didn't have to deliver the the news uh, that unfortunately the boys got um there was just two boys in our under 23 group who were sort of i guess on the fringes of of the first team who had first team decisions um, and they needed to be told so they were told um through phone conversations which um is not the way that you'd like to do it you'd like to do it in person if you could but of course, the situation that we face at the moment, it wasn't safe to do it. Okay, Derek, um, sort of bring you bring you in on board. I mean, obviously, you sort of dealt with a lot of players over your time. Um, so specifically now in in this period, I mean, Peter and Sam's stories does that sort of seem pretty normal to you, or is that kind of well, that seems a little bit shocking the way that that's been handled. I think first of all, you know, this has been unprecedented times, and there could have been, um, you know, potential decisions made on the back of the financial implication, you know, with reference to the uh, the amount of scholars that were prepared to take and the amount of pro contracts that were about to offer. I think the question I'd like to ask Sam, first of all, was obviously this was the second time in his career of rejection as such. Yeah. Did it feel any different, Sam, to the first one? Um... In a sense, yes, because this one didn't hit me, I suppose, as hard as um, the one at Derby, but I feel like I was a lot younger um, at Derby. I wasn't as mature as, say, I am now. Um, and it did become... It was a bit more of a shock, this one, to be fair, because I felt like, again, I put myself in a, go in a good position. Um, I spent a good time of I spent a good time on loan. Um, I think it was a step, step three or four club. And I did really well out there. I had good reports. I had um, a couple of appearances on the bench. And then I was with them in pre-season. And I just felt I'd give myself a good chance um, to get a deal. But it wasn't like, it wasn't as emotional, this one, as, say, the one when I was a bit younger because I'm a bit, I'm more grown up now. I feel I like. Think, you know, uh, Stephen, in, in sort of, you know, in re reflection to both the players, that, you know, people could say they've been unlucky because of what has actually happened, but nothing should come really as a shock to any player uh, mm. when they're being released. Uh, the ECCP, when it was first introduced, and I'm sure that uh, Alex will back me on this one, was to find best practice, um, you know, in all situations, and that included induction procedures, exit procedures, and everything. And I think what has happened is that the unfortunate scenario that we find ourselves in now is that a lot of clubs basically don't know what is happening at this moment in time. Um, and I think that's where the, you know, the sort of stumbling block may be. 
Um, but there are positives to gain, you know, from sort of things that we can go into a little bit uh, further in the meeting. But I think from your point of view and from Peter's point of view, you've got to stay positive because there will be opportunities. You know, you, you mentioned they're playing at 23 level, um, Peter, before. It is a decision, you know, whether you think you get more value playing against men in a lower division or whether you think the 23s is going to give you the, the opportunity for development and, uh, you know, going forward. It, it's one of them where the best people to speak to about that is the people that you're closest to within the club. Yeah, you know, and to Sam, to Sam on that, um, Sam, sort of since you uh, were released, I mean, it's only been a month, but what, what sort of processes have you put in place to help you sort of cope with the situation you now find yourself in? So, I mean, you've got to look to the future, but you've got to as well just think for now. Um, so my agency are trying to sort something out, but at the minute there's not a lot really going on especially with Leagues 1 and 2, their season's been over. No one knows at the minute when pre-season will come around or whatnot. So we're now looking kind of more at men's football for the time being, trying to sort out playing as high as I can at a good good level to try and excel me through that stage. But I've also, myself, got a job. So for the time being, especially because you don't, you just don't know what's what's next now. So I've tried to just get a job and prepare myself for now and then if something does come in the future at least I've got some kind of stability now that if something does come I can go and try and venture for it really. Are you still training? You sort of train? Yeah, I'm, doing, or? I'm doing one-to-ones um, every week um, just with a goalkeeper coach and Shrewsbury did say to me that when they know about pre-season um, that I'm more than welcome to go back in whenever I want to and um, get some get some like training experiences during that. And they said like they'll support me throughout that and try and help as best as they can. And what was your mindset then with that decision, making those decisions that you you've done, you've made um, in terms of getting a job or one to one coach? Was this like as soon as you got released? It was almost like a a panic um, rush to go and do something, or you? I had, a little, I had a little bit of time to just get, get myself together, really. Um, and then about after, say, two weeks of my decision, I was like, well, I don't want to just keep pondering on the fact that, you know, no one's calling to say, like, when, when the season starts again, we want you in. You know, I didn't want my mind just to be thinking about football, really, because I thought that could kind of get me down, especially in these times. You're not really going to be getting too many phone calls. So I got a job just to try and keep my mind off it and then on the night times go and do my one-to-one -one sessions and enjoy football in that way because there was a part where I was like oh, you know after that first that initial reaction of like the day first couple of days after I was just really thinking oh like, what's going to happen with football now I was getting a bit down about it but um, getting a job kind of takes my mind off it now and then I'd go and have my one-to-one -one sessions and Go and enjoy football again, really. Yeah. Cheers, Sam. Um, Peter, with, with you, obviously you mentioned it was slightly different with you, that you were uh, sort of released just before the, the, the breakdown and, and had the opportunity to go on trial at a club. Um, so I guess there was a kind of delay, maybe a delayed feeling and sort of feeling anxious about your situation that you sort of already, you had an opportunity to go elsewhere straight away. Yeah, so when I got released, uh, in about a week's time, I'll went on trial at Barnsley for I think it was two or three games and I, I did really well and um, yeah they got on well the manager he's he said their decision depends on whether they stay in the championship or not so thankfully they beat um, Alex's QPI yesterday thanks for that Peter so yeah that's it's a good deal start for them but anyway uh, yeah and there was another club I was meant to go on trial at just as just the weekend after the lockdown started, so yeah, that was a bit annoying. Obviously, once the lockdown started, none of us knew how serious it was going to be. West Brom was like, no one can come in and train for for the next two weeks, and we thought, oh, all right. So I had about a week off, just sitting around the house all day, and then um, once we everyone realised how severe this was actually going to be, it, it hit me, and 
straight away I had to start putting a plan together of how I was going to keep fit I was going to keep on track of my my gym programs all that kind of stuff my ball work so yeah since the since the lockdown I've at the start of each week I'll put put together a schedule because I'm I'm the type of person that likes to to stick to a schedule instead of just waking up when you want just lounging around so um yeah I've been putting myself in schedule so I'll have some running sessions some like lower body sessions upper body sessions a couple of days off and yeah it's just to keep myself occupied really because uh yeah I like I like to be doing something um, putting the schedule together is something you've done yourself. You've got, or you've got people helping you, helping you out with that, and sort of helping you motivate yourself. Uh, well, I, I definitely put together it together myself. But the inspiration came from for the couple of weeks we had um, some Zoom sessions with with West Brom whilst I was still there. So they've been really great in helping the release players. So that kind of gave me the inspiration to do it. I like, I enjoyed the Zoom sessions and I enjoyed the. The weeks that they were putting together, so I thought, okay, I'll make my own. And ever since, because they stopped as soon as their twenty, the twenty-three season finished, they stopped doing those. So since then, I picked it up myself, and yeah, just carried on. So that, that's where the inspiration came from. Okay, so to bring in with Alex, um, so you'd be aware of how much of a challenge it is during this period to to motivate players and be sort of knowing with players who are still part of your group to keep them motivated so at this period you can probably appreciate how tough it is for Sam and Peter to to maintain that focus when there's not really a lot for them to aim at at this moment in time. Without a doubt and I just wanted to say actually kind of um, massive credit to you both boys for how you've reacted to the news because you know to hear that you've you know managed your own schedules like that and and obviously Sam you've gone out and and, and actually got a job as well I think it shows great maturity on on both of you that you're take you, you know you've taken the news it's obviously disappointing but you've straight away you've used it as as fuel and, and motivation to to try to get yourself back into the game as well um it has been it's been a, a challenge enough to to keep boys motivated who are still at the club no matter the ones that that we're speaking to that are sort of no longer with us as well so um massive credit to you both and i think um i just wanted to pick up on what Derek had said as well, um, which is a fantastic point, that the people that know you best from your clubs are vital uh, at this time. Um, they can provide the best advice. They'll know uh, a lot of people in the game um, and they'll know the appropriate level in the game that they think that they can help you with. So I think it's a, it's a really valid point to make sure you maintain those relationships um, because they, they can open doors for you, essentially. I mean, I'm about to bring Derek back in. I mean, how easy is it for the guys to maintain those relationships? Are, are those doors still open? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think th there's a couple of questions I'd just like to ask the lads, if that's possible, Stephen. And, yeah, and more to do with the actual educational side of things. Whilst they was in the clubs, with the mindset being on becoming professional players, do they now feel, now that that sort of release has happened, they were sufficient in their educational qualifications that they were doing on the back of the scholarship? Do they think it's been beneficial what they did educationally-wise? Or do they think as though they've virtually been thrown into the world now and probably lack you know, some of the qualities that they should have gained? Um, from, from my point of view, um, as good as the educational part of it, was that we got it was never going to be something that I looked at if, if I never got a pro contract really I was never one that wanted to go to, they said all the time it can uh, boast you say if you want to go to university or want to carry on your studies but I'm not the type of person that really wanted to go on and go to university I have to say um, I think it would have been a bit more beneficial for me say if we could choose what we wanted to do instead of just being given something and say, you've got to do this for the two years. If it doesn't work, at least you've got that qualification. So then I feel like it was just used as like a safety blanket for them really yeah. to say, listen, we'll give you this. If it doesn't work, at least you've got this that we've given you really. Yeah. Because yeah. it's not something I'm going to use. That, that diploma I got, I won't ever really use, I don't think. Gotcha. Peter, what about you? Yeah, I think Sam's made a very good point. It would have been more ideal if we got to choose what we wanted to study. 
And yeah, pretty much the same as Sam. I've never really looked at that and thought, oh, I really want to carry that on. But um, it's obviously good that the, the refereeing and coaching coaching um, certificates with us. And the coaching is a thing I've always wanted to, to go into at the end of my career, uh, ideally speaking. But I've, no, I wouldn't say I've looked at those and thought, oh, I want to go into it. My, my ambition is still to, to focus on football and to try and be a footballer at whatever le- level that may be. Then once I know what I'm doing, I can work around that. I'm sure that Alex, you know, would uh, testify that even in um, lockdown as such, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's had hundreds of calls uh, from agents, uh, people trying to, you know, uh, support the players that have been released at this point in time and asking the question, you know, what are you looking for yourselves? And, and clubs will still be looking uh, to make appointments. I think the problem comes, Stephen, is when um, nobody actually knows. None of us have got a crystal ball at this moment in time to know what requirements are from any of the clubs. Um, some may have some sort of idea, uh, but unfortunately they won't be able to put it into practice until the actual uh, restart of the, the season as we know it as such. Um, from the boys' point of view, the reason I ask that question is that you, you normally find that when boys are in a scholarship program, and, and I'm sure Alex you know, can come in on this at some point, the boys somehow forget the educational side of things and see it just as a bolt on attachment um, to the fact that they're doing a scholarship program. And it takes almost second sort of uh, place to the footballing requirements, which obviously that's what they're there for. We all get that. But I think what's got to happen um, from the Premier League's point of view is that there's got to be some kind of a system put in and the EFL where clubs have got the ability to have a centralised database with all of that information to hand on the release players to at least give them an opportunity to be, uh, should we say, put in the shop window. And, And I think with all the best will in the world, I dread to think how many calls Alex Alex gets because I used to get hundreds and hundreds when I was at Man U. And it's not the fact that you don't want to, um, you know, bat players away, but there's only so many that you can actually, you know, listen to, um, take on board and make decisions on. So it's very difficult, I think, in the situation that we're in at the moment for any clarity or transparency to be given until uh, everybody knows what's happening. I think that's a, it's a it's a really important point, Derek. And I think just for the for the boys, I'm I'm sure you you'll be aware. But a lot of um, vast majority of, of academy staff um, at EFL clubs at the moment aren't aren't, aren't actually working. So they'll yeah. be on furlough leave. So the recruitment departments. I mean, at the moment we don't have any recruitment staff working. So yeah. um, myself and, and the head of coaching have been speaking to to the agents. Um, but I guess our our from a, an academy perspective, our recruitment is very much on hold. Um, and I think it's going to be very similar at a lot of clubs. So um, just wanted to make sure that you, you boys are aware of that. So you're not sort of too disheartened, even if you're not getting a sort of a polite response back at the moment, because there might actually be no one at the end of the email just yeah. for now. So it's just, just to sort of highlight that really. Yeah. No, no, yeah. And in terms of that, Sam, I mean, in terms of you finding a club, I mean, is it through the usual channels are you sort of reliant on a, an, an agent making those contacts for you or you're in direct contact with clubs yourself or? it's probably it's more at the minute just something that i leave kind of to the agent or something really and then i'll just like everyone you, you, you learn to know a lot of people through football anyway so there's other people that will help you out along the way that you gain contact with but it's something that i don't directly try and sort out myself and especially as alex was saying that me and my agent already knew that probably a lot of recruitment would be on furlough, so we'll be working at the minute anyway. So there's not a lot out there at the minute. That's probably why I got a job as well, because there's not a lot out there at the minute anyway. I've just got to be patient, really. Um, but it's something I just leave to my agent. Uh, and the club, Shrewsbury, are they sort of helping you find? Yes. So they messaged me the other day and said that they've sent out a whole list and like a profile of each of us to um, step two clubs downwards because they said that they uh, think gaining men's experience would be more valuable than like going into a 23s club or something like that. But they said as well, 
a lot of pro clubs are going to be on furlough anyway. So we'd rather send it to the teams that are a bit more active at the minute and trying to get players in. And for you, Peter, what's your, your experiences around around that finding a club? Is it similar to, to Sam? Yeah, definitely. Some of my agents have been trying to talk to clubs and stuff. And uh, I've also set up a LinkedIn profile to try and get in contact with some people at clubs. And like Alex said, a lot of them come back saying they're furloughed. Sorry, they can't help. They're, they're, they're quite polite, most of them. But yeah, it is pretty much the same. Um, so all the football league clubs are pretty much not, not doing anything, especially the league one and two sides, because obviously their season has been finished. But... Um, yeah, but so that's how I've been doing it, really. And on that, Alex, obviously, uh, Derek mentioned you probably received lots and lots of uh, inquiries from agents and sort of clubs passing you information. I mean, to what extent does does that does that work? Does it catch your notice? I mean, you're going to have your own network of scouts. You're going to be aware of players and players of, who are already interested in you. Yeah, I mean, it, um, there, there's been a large uh, sort of uh, spike in, in the amount of emails and phone calls that have been coming in at the moment for, for obvious reasons. And I think uh, someone mentioned to me the other day that there are, it's, it's, it's a huge pool of players that are, you know, out of contracts at the moment. It's, it's, I heard figures of 400 scholars and, and potentially up to a thousand pros. So there is a, a large pool. Um, and we, we obviously have a recruitment team uh, in, the, in our academy that is, is established and, and have got uh, scouting structures that operate in, in areas such as uh, non-league, for example, like the boys are talking about, we've probably been more um, sort of present in, in non-league football than we have ever before. So it's, uh, I think it's really good to hear that the boys are considering that option uh, because from a recruitment perspective, one of the first thing that's spoken about with 23s football, and I'm sure Derek uh, will hear this a lot is, well, can, can they cope in a men's environment? Is, is it something that they'll be able to do? So by taking that step to potentially get experience in, in that men's environment kind of can, can prove, that, prove that point initially. And then um, who's to say then that that doesn't you know, result in a, in a step back into, into a league club. So I think it's definitely uh, an option that should be considered. Um, and going back to your point about um, kind of that contact that comes in, we definitely take a look at everything. Um, we try to, we, we get back to everyone for sure. Um, it might not be what they, you know, what they want to hear, but we do, we want to ensure that we're uh, representing the club properly and, and doing the right thing by getting back to people. Um, with you, you, Derek, I mean, um, see so you'd have your past experiences at, similar to Alex when you was at United and you'd take a similar approach that you would answer everything? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm sure that Alex's department was probably no different to Manchester United. As I said, best of practice, you know, was adapted by uh, by most clubs. Um, you, you've got to remember that sometimes the requirements are positional. Sometimes they're age-related. It, it, it's dependent very much upon what the necessity is uh, of the club going forward. But what we used to do, we used to have a, a, a sort of hit list that we would have as such and we'd have maybe three or four players within that hit list. Um, we used to do a, a minimum of 10 reports, um, probably many, many more, you know, for, for some of the players. Um, that was because we were looking for consistency. We wanted to make sure that if a player was going to come in under the pressure scenario uh, of a club like Manchester United, you know, could he cope with it? Was his mental state, uh, you know, fragile? Was it sturdy? Did he have, you know, family support? There's a lot of criteria, you know, in a player coming into a club and I think from Sam and Peter's point of view um, they mustn't like I said you know earlier on they must stay positive about this because these times I don't think anybody you know expected anything like this um, I've been in football over 40 years and it's certainly never ever happened in my lifetime so it's it's one of them really really unprecedented times where nobody at this moment in time is prepared to take a gamble you know, on the amount of scholars that they may bring in, the amount that they, obviously there's lots being released, like Alex said, um, that could be down to financial implications, that could be down to other reasoning. But the one thing that, you know, the, the boys, the, the, the sort of question I was asking regarding the education as to whether they had any deviation of thought after being released uh, from a footballing perspective. And I know Sam said that he's got another job. It's very much a case of, 
Alex mentioned there, there is opportunity. The universities, I remember when I was at Manchester United, we had the Olympic Committee came down asking if we could identify athletes out of the players that were potentially going to be released. And that was because they were looking for other avenues, other areas of expertise where they could push these players to, you know, rather than it just be football, 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 football. Um, and, and I think the, the educational side of it has been, you know, it's been talked about, but it's very, very important because not everybody knows it's not just a case of being released because, you know, potentially they may think they're not good enough. There could be injuries, you know, before these players. There could be illnesses of any sorts. So you, you've got to cover a vast spectrum, you know, of reasons behind it. But the one thing that should never, ever happen is that there should never be any doubt in a player's mind that he gets released on a whim at the very last moment. These decisions should have been made and should have been transparently, you know, with the parent and the player through the course of reports that are done over the period of the year. And then the exit process is one that, you know, benefits everybody. It doesn't come as a shock. And like the two lads have said, they both anticipated it. So therefore, the club must have given them indication prior to the release that the potential was that they were lacking in some area. And I don't mean that as a slight on the boys, but I'm sure if you ask them what the weak areas was within there, the makeup, the boys would probably tell you. Yeah, that's that's a really, that's a really imp another really important point, Derek, because I think one thing that we identified sort of three or four years ago that we didn't do very well as a club was provide consistent and honest feedback through the time at which a player was with the club. Um, the what you spoke about the E Triple P and, and this you know the PMA system that the boys will know really well. Yeah. Um, and lots of things is quantified by a colour code or a number. Um, and I think at points that can mislead uh, parents and players into thinking that maybe then at a level that means that they're going to be retained, but actually it comes to the release and then all of a sudden it's well, I, you know, I thought I was a green here and a green here. So how can I be released if I've if I've not got a red in that area, for example. So we actually uh, decided to work with our psychology team to provide CPD for the staff on effective report writing uh, and providing feedback in, in, in debrief meetings and reviews because we identified that there were too many players and parents shocked when we got to that point. Um, and and we've, we've, as I said before, it's, it's never going to be a nice experience. We, we appreciate that, but we have to be accountable as a club to make sure that it isn't a player getting to that point and assuming it's a guarantee and then getting that, that news which could, you know, could be more crushing if, 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 than if we'd have been honest throughout the whole procedure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with, with you, Sam, I mean, was that the case? I mean, you sort of mentioned that it wasn't a shock, but was it not a shock because you'd been getting this feedback from the club or was it just your own intuition that other things were going on around the club that sort of made you think, yeah, I'm kind of on the outside here now. Um, I mean, we used to get, obviously, everyone knows about probably the six-week reviews and we have our six-week review and you'll go through your clips, what we need to work on and whatnot. Um, and, I mean, in my case, I didn't feel like in them times they were um, too negative or gave me an inkling towards, like, listen, you've really got to push on now if you want to try and get anything. But it was more a fact of, there was other things that happened within that time. Um, they brought in a lad uh, who's my age back onto a first year scholarship. So he was my age, but he was on a first year and he'll have another year next year. And then I got sent out on loan. And then as good as that, as good as that experience was for me, I kind of t took it as like, well, I'm not getting shipped off now, but like, you know, I'm kind of just being pushed to the side a little because, I mean, in my time on loan, I think they wa they watched me once whilst I was out there um, and that was it really. And I had real good reports back from it, but by that time I kind of was already trying to prepare myself for what, what's after this now. So it weren't a case of, my six week reviews were quite positive most of the time, <coughs> um, but it was more actual things happening around me. Peter, Sam, can, can I just ask, Stephen, if, if possible, when I was at Man United, obviously, we used to provide um, basically guest speakers from all different sort of areas of industry um, to look for basically alternate professions that may sort of 
fit in the profile of some of the players. Um, yeah. We found it beneficial. Like it opened their horizons, you know, to alternate, uh, you know, jobs, etc. It wasn't a case of we're pushing you down this route, bringing this speaker in because we think you need another job because we're going to release you. It was basically to because when you're in football, I think we spoke about this earlier on, Sam. You become very. Um, you know, very cocooned to a degree with your social friends and your social life. And, and I think gaining that sort of, you know, experience of having different environments and different people just helps to educate and nurture the player, you know, to become that more rounded individual rather than just being a rejected footballer. Yeah, you know? 100%. I mean, we had some good talks from um, people that came in from the PFA ex-pros of what they've done now, how they dealt with different things and then life if football weren't to work. And I mean, our eyes were all open to the fact that there's different things after football. It's not just we all are one-minded of making us footballers. There's lots of branches that make a tree, really. You know, there's lots of different avenues you could go down. Um, right, before I bring in Sarah, Sarah Murray, um, just... We just sort of quickly ask Peter. I mean, Derek touched on the the social side there. I mean, in terms of yeah, you were cocooned within the sort of the West Brom family, and now you're on the outside. How does that feel? All those sort of relationships you've been relying on for the last five six years, do they feel as as strong as ever, or does it feel yeah, I'm kind of not part of this anymore, and it's hard to maintain those relationships? There's definitely members of staff that have got on better than got on with better than others. So the physio I've stayed in really good contact with. He's always asking, "Oh, how how are you feeling? Do you need do you need any help with uh, injuries and stuff?" Because I've had a few injuries over the years. But um, some of the lads I've I've stayed in touch with throughout the whole time. Yeah, it's been really good. Like meet them some days to do train to do training and to like maybe have a round of golf or something. So it, it's been good. I don't feel like. As of yet, I've re- I don't. It's hard to explain. I've I've kept all my relations well with everyone apart from the coach. I'd say, I mean, the coach has been the one that's made me feel like I'm I'm not part of it anymore. If that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, in particular, like not playing much, and that's all. Well, that's obviously down to him. He's on the fix the team. Okay, um, for you as well, Sam. I mean, maybe sort of bring in your experiences with Derby because there's been a bit. You've had a two-year gap, so uh, sort of, yeah, how have those relationships maintained at, at Derby and, and then similarly, obviously, in the month since you sort of left uh, Shrewsbury? So, um, I, the relationships with Derby kind of, with the lads anyway, have stayed strong. I mean, I was with them from quite young all the way through and I've maintained them. Um, with the coaches as much, probably probably not as much because we've I've just moved on and they've moved on. Um, but with the lads at Shrewsbury, I mean, I'm in contact with them all, but I mean, with quite a lot of them, but I can't see any of them because I'm not very close to Shrewsbury as it was. But the coaches as well, I haven't really spoken to them. I mean, they, one of the lads was saying, we all got told about our um, decisions. Then I think it was like a week or two weeks later, there was a new group chat made with like all the new lads that were coming in and everything. And I think it, all of them then just took priority. Um, and we were just kind of left to our own devices a little bit. They said um, that we was always welcome to join in with the Zooms or anything, but we all just felt like now that we was kind of just castaways with it now, especially like we weren't invited into them things. We were just told we could join if we wanted to. Um, so I haven't really kept in contact too much, really. My goalkeeper coach has message me sometimes and we've had some calls to be fair but he's probably the only one really okay so to, uh... Stephen, can I, Stephen can I just ask a question if I if I can to the boys um because uh listening to Sam you spoke really nicely about um listening to the experiences of of, of others and you know ex-pros and people from the PFA coming in um yeah. what, one thing that we're uh looking at as a potential project to kind of move that forward we, we're big believers in in our informal life skills program as well so we probably had a number of similar speakers that lfe has sent in that you guys have had um one of the things that we're actually looking to do is is to arrange work work experience placements um for the scholars to 
just get a feel of of what a working environment is like and what what an office might be like or what a, a I don't know a, a not necessarily a building site but you know dif what different trades look like in in the real world and um it kind of came into my mind because I, I'd done the MVQ session which was around career management um and the boys piecing together their understanding of what it would take to become qualified in something else or what experience you might need for a certain job so um and then linking that to their interests so um peter you spoke about wanting more choice um you know the the course is kind of a one size fits all really and then you boys felt though as though that really maybe not going to help you in the next stage if if there was an opportunity for you guys if you had a particular interest so we've got a little cohort of the boys that love um that love music and property they, they seem to be the two things that, that tend to crop up a lot in fashion so we've started speaking with a, a big estate agency firm in london and we're hoping to place a few of the boys next season the ones that are interested to go in and spend whether it be sort of an afternoon every four to six weeks in one of their offices would that have been something for for you that you think you would have valued or do you think whilst you're in the bubble of football you, you wouldn't want to hear it. No, it sounds like a very good idea. I think at the time you might think, oh, this is a bit of a chore. I've just finished training. I don't want to be spending the afternoon here. But looking back at it now, I think that would be a great idea for the future. For I wish I had that type of opportunity. But yeah, like even like you said, no. no I really, as much as I thought about it during lockdown, I actually really don't know what I'd do if it wasn't football. I know my, my parents are... Um, recruitment, uh, have a recruitment agency that could be something, but like you said, a, an experience like that would have maybe helped get a better decision of what I'd want to do apart from football. So, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And yourself, Sam, would that have been something that no, would have been valuable? I think that it would, especially as well, you say, like, because you, you're in the bubble of uh, football, it's a bit really, it's a bit of a risk at our age to say that because, like us now, we've We've not been given the news we wanted, and like Peter, for example, he doesn't have a clue what he'd want to do now if it weren't football. So if you've at least been given that opportunity to go to different trades and have a look and say, oh, that might be something actually I might want to do if, say, football weren't to work, I think that would be a really good idea. Yeah, uh, Sarah Murray from uh, Brighton joining us. Um, Sarah, you've been uh, listening uh, so far. just wanted to bring you in and... Uh, and share your thoughts on what you've heard and obviously any any questions you've got for Sam and Peter at this point. We've got you on mute, Sarah. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there yes. we go. Yeah. So, I mean, it's been a really interesting discussion and, and it's mirrored quite a lot of the discussions that I've been involved in over the years at Brighton. Um, and I think Kind of before I go to a couple of questions that I'd have for, for yourself, Sam and, and Peter, there's a real overriding theme here that everyone's spoken about around this understanding of the, the human being and this identity of, of being more than just a footballer. Um, because at the at very best, if, if your journey in football goes as you wish it to, um, it, by the time you're in your early 20s, you've got, what, 10, maybe 15 years left at best. And, and after that, no matter what, there's, there's a, a long life ahead. So that's really come through strongly in, in all the discussions. Um, and I think it's really key to how then a player will respond and react to, to being released. Um, and I appreciate Sam and Peter, your reactions have been quite different. Um, but I think, uh, again, a theme is that, that you understand yourselves and that certainly Sam in your case, um, you've got this other avenue that you're pursuing. So Sam, I would like to ask you, what would you say in the first line of a letter to yourself six months ago? What would that read? Dear Sam, what would you say? Um, Knowing what you know now. Yeah, um, probably just, to, I'd probably say that look look further than football i'd say look further than football because you know knowing what i know now especially after um getting released again i didn't have a clue what i wanted to do um i probably still don't i've gone into a job now luckily with the help of my dad 
But at the time, I never took it really seriously, looking at anything else, because I always said, listen, football's all I want to do. I'm a young lad. That's the only career path since I've been seven that I've ever thought of doing. But I suppose there needs to become a time where you become a bit more serious to the fact that you might not actually make a career out of football. So start looking and seeing what other things you might be interested in, really. I think that that would be what I'd say, just look a bit further than football. Great, thanks. I saw the look of uh, relief on Pete's face when I went to you first, Sam. <laughs> a bit of thinking time. Um, Pete, what, was, what, would, what would you say six months ago? What would you have written to yourself? Even with Sam talking, I don't really know what to say. I'll just say that I definitely would have should have looked further past football, definitely, but it's hard to say because football is, is my, my goal and you, you, sh you shouldn't give up on your dreams. And I would have said to myself six months ago, if, if you work hard for the next six months and do your best, then you can be proud of yourself. And that is what I've done. So it's a, it's a hard one to answer. I know what you're trying to say, but... Um, yeah. Matt, I would have said one thing and that would have been go on loan earlier. But that's not very psychological, that's very football. Yeah, but, but that is the one thing I would have maybe said to myself, yeah, six months ago. Mm. Go on but you, earlier. you are a footballer and I completely, I think that's a really, really great point that you've made, Peter, that actually when you identify yourself as solely a footballer, it, it, it's not necessarily a negative, it's a very natural thing to do because as you said, it's your passion, it's your goal, it's what you, it's what you want. It's, I guess, understanding that actually the value of who you are outside of that to complement that football journey, to actually support you on that football journey, no matter how long it lasts. Um, and that actually it's, it's not necessarily a case of one or the other, as we, as we so often see, because that can lead to, to players finding themselves um, in a place where emotionally they're, they're coming out of the game and it's, and it's really hard, really hard for them. Um, so it's a case of how does that identity outside of football support the football journey for as long as you're in it. I mean, uh, on that, Sarah, I mean, we've heard a little bit of from Alex and, and what they're doing at QPR in terms of that. I mean, uh, what's, uh, what are you doing at Brighton to help support that? Yeah, so, um, again, I think it's really important, and Alex mentioned it earlier, about signposting players, being really transparent with them the whole way through so that actually when they are released, there's not a massive shock so that it's not a complete bolt from the blue. So there's, there's some understanding, but equally being transparent in terms of what we're there for, being not only to produce elite footballers to, to source our first team, which of course, you know, we're a category one academy in a, in a premiership team, but actually that we are there to, to give a massively beneficial experience to the players. So whether it be outside speakers and, and their experiences of, life after football or life alongside football, things that they can do, things that interest them, or whether it's the numerous trips and tours. Most players at Brighton, many of them, would have had their first, um, first trip abroad, certainly the younger ones with the club, their first trip to tours and, and things. And the experiences that gives them beyond just the football pitch are really, really beneficial for when they leave those doors for the last time because whether you are a member of staff or a player, we are all going to leave those training ground doors for the very last time at some point. And it's important to have a real realistic view of that and it not necessarily being a bad thing. So yeah, we would, we would work with players post-release support to kind of answer your question. All players would be offered post-release um, support somebody to talk to, somebody to just um, clear their head with after being released. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a sports psychologist. It really doesn't matter who it is. It could be that they have a great relationship with the coach. It could be the physio that's already been mentioned. It, it, it doesn't really matter who it is. It's that we're still there. You know, we are still there to support the next part of the journey. Um, and we've played a part in that. And, and we're still always going to play a part in that. Um, so it's important that players know that they've got that from us, whatever they need from us moving forward. Yeah, um, on that, Alex, I mean, it's something we mentioned when you, or you mentioned when we spoke during the week in terms of the, the sort of the 
wellness support, the, the mindfulness support that you give players and, and sort of having that balance. And maybe you feel that maybe sometimes it, players can be too reliant on it because you don't continue to give them that support once you release them. So where do you think that balance is currently? Obviously, it's been put under a lot of stress in the last three months. But yeah, where do you think or your processes are? Where do you feel that process is with football in general? I think it's, um, I think it's a difficult balance to find. We have um, limited resources um, at our club. Uh, we would love, and I've heard a lot about Brighton's um, support of their players, which I know is, is fantastic. So um, I'm envious of, of being in a position where I've got lots of staff that can assist in that um, sort of exit of, of the club. We do, we do use, of course, what we have and, and we do make sure that we do speak to players as much as we can and, and make sure they know we're there um, and how we can help them and, and where we can signpost them to as well. Um, and it's, um, I'm, I'm pleased you brought it up because I was actually just going to ask Sarah that question about balance because we do group sessions with, um, take, take the boys age group, for example, the under 18s. Uh, we do say mindfulness uh, sort of once a week with our under 18s. We'll have um, sort of psych education around psychology. So we talk a lot about developing resilience at the academy. So it's a, um, a topic that we spend a lot of time on in the classroom uh, with our very, very good psychology team. Um, but one conversation that we've continuously had is making sure, like you mentioned there, Steve, is that we, of course, want to support the players while they're in the building. Um, but it might be that the most challenging part of their academy career of when they're at QPR is actually when they've left the building. And are we setting them up for that to be a harder transition if we provide lots and lots and lots of support whilst they're in the building, but are they not in a position to get close to that level of support when they, when they exit? Um, so I'd be really interested to hear what your thoughts on that are, Sarah. Yeah, I think, I think that's a, it's a really valid point. And I would say that our role, and when I say us, I mean, you know, whether it's the performance psychologists, coaches, academy managers, everybody, is to actually prepare that player to have the, the tools that he needs so that when he leaves the building, the impact of him being released is not as emotionally catastrophic as, as it could be. And so our job, you know, understandably, we can't, with all the resources in the world, we cannot be there and do it for them. And I think it's really important that we, we don't actually support them and actually force that support on them, that, that mm. players know how to support themselves. And they, they understand their own emotional reactions. They understand what it's gonna feel like, what it's gonna be like. And that actually they then have, within the academy, what we've done, is support them to develop the tools to be able to cope with that. So that actually we are at no point um, a kind of someone that they have to go back to, somebody that they can't live without. It's about us just helping them to do it for themselves and not doing it for them. Mm. Hopefully that sort of answers your question because, yeah, we, we can't be there for the next 50 years. Yeah, definitely. And, and as I mentioned, um, and it's one of our sort of academy standards, it, it is resilience. And it's something that we try to instill from uh, an early point in the, in the academy journey as well. It's something that we try to educate our schoolboy players on. It's not something that we just, as you say, sort of force on, force on the scholars at any point. It's, um, it's a value and a, a sort of a, a skill that we do try to enhance as they, as they get older and sort of understand more about, you know, how the journey might look and and where potential exits might be but as you say it's not just that also it's not just about necessarily the football career it's actually a toolkit for life as well so um life is going to be full of ups and downs for all of us and 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 hopefully we would like to think at our academy that when the boys do leave our program we have provided them with a skill set to enable them to cope better than they would have done had they not have experienced our program yeah, I would completely agree with that. I mean, everything we're doing is setting them up to be really good human beings that happen to play great football. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that sounds massively cheesy, doesn't it? But, but actually, if we can understand, if we can understand the human and the player better, ultimately, we're going to get more from them on a pitch anyway, as a byproduct, which then is a bit of a win-win. If I could um, sort of ask... Ask Derek a little bit about that. Seeing your your role now with Omni Sports, you've sort of experienced with a, a lot of players 
coming in and, and out of clubs. Um, in terms of what Alex and Sarah are speaking about, are you finding the, the players are coming out with the tools to cope with the situation more than I think it's 10, 15, 20 years ago? Yeah, it's a lot, lot better. You know, all the improvements have been made, uh, you know, at all levels. But I think what you've got to sort of bear in mind is that when a boy comes into an academy, say from, from the legal age where they can be signed, that sort of eight and a half, nine years of age, they are under total scrutiny, you know, from their ability point of view, from the, the, the makeup point of view, the whole, you know, everything with regards to the persona of the player, his background um, is under scrutiny. And to some, it, it can be a daunting sort of prospect, you know, where continually they're being assessed, continually they're being monitored. But like Alex has said, and like Sarah has said, the clubs are now adaptable you know, to identifying where the support me mechanisms are really needed. And I think what you find now is that because clubs are thinking out of the box, and Alex mentioned about the, the job experience, you know, doing things like that, the, the club are becoming more um, amiable in giving the lads the opportunity to, to not only have their own personality, but to be made aware to all the pitfalls in life. And one of the biggest pitfalls is the IT uh, era that we're in. You know, the, the social media is, is literally, it, it picks everybody off, you know, without a shadow of a doubt. But what you find is that speaking to, you know, Peter, speaking to Sam before, you can see that rounded sort of understanding, that more matured uh, ability, you know, that people that wasn't in that, environment might not have had and although you know um although peter doesn't really know at this moment in time where his next step's going to take him at least he has a better understanding you know from the people that he said he's kept contact with and like i said people like sarah people like alex these are the people that they need to talk to be open be frank be honest any concerns this is why that word transparency for me is the most important vital element <coughs> excuse me of any player in any club environment because if you haven't got that if there's no understanding then you're going to send him out into the world he's going to be full of um, falling into a state of depression if you wish you know from the fact that he has been released but what i'm finding now is players are coming out with a lot more positivity than maybe they would have done 10 years ago 10 years ago, it have almost been like the guillotine has been dropped on them, you know, and that's their end of their life type of thing. But now, I mean, just to, to give them a little fillip, if it helps them, when I was 16, I was at Burnley, broke my leg in three places, but I never gave up. Peter mentioned having a dream. I didn't stay in football, although I did become a coach. Yes, although I was a player, a coach, you know, went into recruitment. The fact is, I stayed in doing something that I loved, but that wasn't my main role. My main job, I was a, a, a regional manager with BT with about 500 staff. But if you've still got that love and still got that ambition and craving to be involved, there's nothing to stop you. And on that, Sam, um, so we're talking about sort of having the skills one to, to deal with this situation emotionally. Do you feel as if yeah, you've had those and you've been able to sort of use those to help you sort of deal with one derby and then this past month and mostly just just to maintain your love of the game yeah i think so i mean uh shrewsbury and derby when i was there we were both very passionate about bringing in people and putting on courses for us and whatnot to be able to learn about the different skills and the different techniques and the different people we could speak to if we ever needed something and how to deal with it say if there wasn't that person next to you at the minute to to speak to i think especially shrewsbury they've given me the skills now to go on after after this to do whatever i want to and to keep my love for the game there just as much as it was before this lockdown really i mean with yourself peter it seems clear that you're very similar to sam that love that dream has not left you but obviously as a group amongst uh, your your teammates at west brom you feel that Everyone is kind of feels the same, or is it one or two players who maybe are feeling feeling a little bit more feeling this a little bit harder than others? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, we've also got the same dream, but obviously there is some a couple of lads that have been given the same news as me that have actually straight straight up said to me that 
football might not be for them. No, I don't really know what that is. It might be confidence. It might be just them being a bit down. But yeah, some of them have said that they might not go back into football. But for me, obviously, like you mentioned, the, the dream's still there. I still believe in my own ability, and I just I just hope hoping for a good opportunity and see where that takes me. Yes, Sarah. Uh, the aim is is um, that even with the boys, if they're not going to make it at, at Brighton, you still want them to yeah, have a lifetime involved in football, whether it be just playing for fun or or as a pro at, at a different club. Yeah, absolutely. And and Sam mentioned it early on in in this session, actually. And, and Sam, you talked about the kind of regaining the enjoyment a little bit. Um, yeah. Just kind of remind us of. of, of how important that is for you at the moment and why it is that maybe you lost it? Well, massively, I think um, that first initial couple of days after the rejection and you look at it and you, and you think everything's against you, really. You know, you're looking at football and you think, gosh, am I, you start down yourself, really. Am I, am I, was I really good enough and am I good enough to carry on? And then, you know, having a, having a little break from it, getting yourself together and then actually think to yourself, listen, of course I'm good enough to be where I was, you know. It just didn't work out there, but who's to say it can't work out somewhere else? And you've just got to build yourself back up, really, because I feel like everyone can get really down and then kind of just throw, it, throw all that time and effort away. But just taking the time out, regrouping, and then getting the love back for it is the main thing because if you're doing something and you're just going in there you're kind of doing it just as a job really and you're not enjoying it there's no point in my opinion especially if you're not enjoying it no more that's really that sort of um it resonates massively and, and what a lot of players lose and as they as they move through the kind of the upper echelons if you like of the game is that connection of the why the connection yeah, of the why you play football in the first place and for you know i can assure you of all the players i've ever worked with no player has ever told me about being a five, six, seven-year-old boy and his primary reason was, was to make money. It was exactly. always enjoyment as a primary and the connection with that definitely gets lost. And often once you regain that connection, actually the, the future starts to look bright and you start to, as you said, build yourself back up and, and continue the journey. 100%, yeah. I mean, uh, on that, Alex, I mean, to try and switch it another way around, um, sort of a phrase of, of, of coaches, you never want to be a player's last coach, um, which is obviously very hard if you're within a, an academy system where, like with Sam and Peter, you're going to, you know, you're going to let those, let players go and you're, you're sort of killing their dreams. So how do you then sort of develop your model for coaching so that if, you know, at whatever time players' time comes to an end with you, that you know it doesn't necessarily mean it will be the end of their involvement in football. Um, I think the way that we structure our coaching program, um, we try to well, we 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 do sorry develop adaptable players. Um, the way in which they're coached and the you know the syllabuses that we have in place across different age groups. So we uh, we have a lot of experimentation. We're very creative. So players in the younger age groups, for example, play in a number of positions to give them different experiences. Um, we will try to uh, provide different experiences through our games program as well. So whether it's playing against international opposition or playing a range of different category academies, non-leagues when they get to 18, 23s, trying to give them as many different footballing experiences as we can to, you know, give them the best opportunities to succeed in an environment and um, it's a really important point, Sam, and another really mature one that you mentioned. It, it just might not have been the right time for you at your club. Um, we've got a player at the moment in our first team who's uh, been linked with a lot of Premier League teams um, for, this, for this coming summer. And I think he'd been released by four or five clubs. And whenever we speak about him, a lot of people will say, I can't believe he got released by that club when he was 18. But it just wasn't the right club for him at that time in his, in his career. And Fortunately for us and for him, it was a very good match when he came in on trial at our place and it just fit. Um, so it's, I think that there's, a, there's certainly an element of fortune in, in being in the right place at the right time. You have to have the trust of, of the staff that 
that you work for uh, and work alongside. Um, but we, we just try to make sure that we're accountable by providing a range of opportunities that make players as adaptable as possible for whichever level of football that may take them to. And a, a bit on that, Derek, I mean, um, just wonder what sort of feedback you've been getting from clubs. You're sort of noticing players being released at this moment in time. You think there's a certain sense of, of panicking around the financial situation, which means that players who would normally be given an extra couple of years to develop yeah, uh, might not be getting it now? It, it's, it's very difficult to... Um, you know, to sort of discuss individual clubs as such. But there certainly appears to have been a period of um, panic, like you mentioned, um, because of the fact that the financial implications are not clear in reference to, I mean, if you take the EFL, you know, the fact that they, they, they finished the leagues, these, these clubs couldn't play behind closed doors. So it just wasn't viable. Um, so consequently, you know, clubs like Shrewsbury, uh, Preston as such, you know, they've all done exactly the same. They've released a, a plethora of scholarship players, a plethora of professional players, and under normal circumstances, they may possibly have given them another 12 months, you know, to justify their, uh, their inclusion there, um, see how the development progressed, you know, and, and possibly have maybe have offered them something further down the line. But at this moment in time, that isn't the case. And the circumstances we're in, I think they're all erring on the side of caution. Okay. And on top of that, I am Sam. Um, sort of bringing a, a sort of question here from Stephen Fenning. Um, in terms of, yeah, would you sort of been looking at opportunities abroad, whether that be other clubs at different levels overseas, or, or I think as Alex mentioned, there's increasingly there seems to be the, the scholarship route in the US. Um, it was definitely something when I first got released by Shrewsbury, I was looking at to go to America this summer, but um, we felt, me and my family especially, it was maybe something that was a bit too rushed in this time. You know, I, I, it was something I really wanted to do, but never actually gave it any thought. It was just something I always wanted to do. So um, we agreed as a, as a family, for example, we'd have a year in England now. I'd have a year here over in England give myself the best chance over here for the next year. And if it wasn't to work over here, definitely something by the time next summer comes to try and apply for scholarships out there, really. And I'd, I'd, by that time, I'd have more of an understanding of it all because I was going into a bit blind this this summer. See, with uh, yourself, Peter, you sort of mentioned the opportunity uh, that obviously QPR helped you out with yesterday. Um, sorry, Alex. Um, does that mean you kind of not really looking too deeply elsewhere, or at least not outside of, of the UK at this moment in time, or is overseas a, a serious proposition for you? Uh, yeah, like, Touchwood, like you said, I've got a few opportunities here in England. So everyone's heard of the, the scholarships in America. It's, it's never been something I've really wanted to do to be fair there's um there's some other options in sweden as well like uh the second division in there take on a lot of players from england which has been mentioned by my agent and stuff but yeah like you said there has been been some opportunities in england so ideally i'd try and stay in england like you said just to put it bluntly um, just on, on that i mean derek you touched on a little bit earlier and obviously you've been involved with Manchester United in the scouting network there, bringing players in. Yeah. Do you think there's a strong enough network within the clubs that help players move on? Well, th this goes back to what we were saying about the uh, the implication of the E Triple P. You know, when that was brought in, um, what that did was it gave you know license to increase the sort of facilities, whether it be sort of coaching, scouting. Um, infrastructure, you know, many, many things. Um, but the one thing that I was always conscious of at Manchester United was the fact that if we had the courtesy to bring a player in, we should we should adopt the same courtesy when it comes to release. And we we certainly had, um, you know, I mean, it's, you've got to remember that you're talking about uh, a Cat One club, you know, produce more um, academy players into the first team than any other club, and. 
we was renowned for boys always being picked off, you know, once we'd released them. They'd always got that option, you know, going to another premiership club or even down to the championship. Unfortunately, in sort of Sam's position, he doesn't have that luxury. You know what I mean? So yeah. the clubs in the lower division should be making it um, more of a sort of, you know, a necessity to make sure that enough information is got out there for these boys to maintain some level of football. Um, and, and, you know, it's been touched on before. It doesn't matter what level. They will eventually find their own level that they feel very comfortable in. Um, you know, that Peter mentioned sort of playing at sort of senior men's level rather than 23's level. Um, there's benefits to both. You know, I don't think, I'm sure Alex would be the first to agree. I don't think the 23 is ideal you know, by way of leagues and the way it's structured um, and the development of the players as such. And consequently, I think what you have to do and what I certainly did at Manchester United was I used every available um, tact, if you wish, to notify clubs of their availability. Um, I made sure that all our administration staff, you know, got the notifications out to them to give the boys the benefit, you know, of, of possibly getting... Um, some alternate career and believe it or not we, we actually fix players up I mean you mentioned the USA before I'm going slightly off on a tangent but we, we fixed up players in America you know we've fixed up players in other sort of avenues of sport physiotherapy you know um, and things like that and it and this is what we we're talking about we've got to maintain that interest some way if it is a passion and a love you know, for the likes of Sam and Peter. And there are hundreds and hundreds of players out there who are in the same situation at this moment in time. It, it's an unfortunate, you know, um, area at this moment that we find ourselves in. But it's one that we've got to hope and pray that we come through, you know, for the benefit of everybody to maintain what we had previously, you know, which potentially we could have taken for granted. And on that, Sarah, I mean, at Brighton, you're obviously doing some, some great work there. Um, still, obviously, we're always striving to do, to do better. Where, particularly from learning from this period, where do you feel that you can do better in helping, like you say, players who do leave the building take that next step, wherever that may be? Um, in terms of the, the kind of the architecture, I guess, of the whole academy and actually the performance psychologist's role and Alex touched on this earlier, being about supporting the coaches and supporting the staff to be able to, to understand the, the players better um, so that we, we get more out of them. But then also so that when, you know, if they do get released, we better understand potentially what, what that's going to be like for them and, and actually signpost them to whatever their, the next step of their journey is going to be and make sure that that's the right fit for them. Um, we would do something so very similar with our players that, that go out on loan. Um, where possible, 100%, we look at actually the best fit for them, not just in terms of the style of football that they might play, but actually for who they are, their character, their personality, um, and actually them as a, as a person, does it fit? Um, so I think we've, we've learned a lot through lockdown. And I think, as I've said before, we've had a unique opportunity to gain real insight into what makes our players tick and how they respond when they have to take ownership. It's been fascinating to see how players' behavioural responses have differed to lockdown. Just listening to you, Sam, and, and Peter, you've had a similar experience, but you're both very individual. You know, you, you, you're doing different things with that, with the, your releases. So, yeah, I think moving forward, we need to take that with us. Um, yeah, I think that's the, the question then for, for Alex. Um, I would say as, as much as the lockdown has been a, a challenge for, for clubs, as Sarah says, it has given you an insight into the players at QPR. I mean, how do you take that sort of understanding, how you've been able to go into players' environments and get a real understanding of them and bring it back with you when things return to normal because uh, I guess with all the will in the world parents are not going to allow you to spend two months with a camera inside their house in the future. Oh it's true. Um, I think we, yeah just to kind of mention how important that point's been we've definitely learned a lot about um, a lot more about the backgrounds of our players and it's something that 
we're, we're speaking about now, it's a learning that we've taken away and thought actually we need to encourage our players to have opportunities to speak about that uh, at the academy and, and as staff then to be accountable for kind of maintaining that culture um, and participating in it. So being, uh, making sure that as, as staff, we, we stick, to those, um, stick to those things that we're expecting of, of, of the players as well, whether it, that's our standards, talking about cultural backgrounds, et cetera. So it's, um, we've learned a lot. And I think we, as a group of staff now, are just trying to think about how, how we uh, continue to develop the culture at the academy um, to ensure that it's as good an experience as a young boy as it can be. Um, and we're not just talking about football. This is going back to Sarah's point about helping young people to mature into young men, young boys into young men. And what, what can we do then as an, an academy to provide a range of experiences? So lots of different ideas and, and a big one has been um, talking about work. So those work experience placements for under 18s, that's the type of conversation we're having at the moment, uh, along with um, young players having the opportunity to speak about what, what makes them, what's their personal identity. Thanks, Alex. Um, Derek, along, along those lines of sort of having an insight into the players through, through the families, I know uh, from, from a scout, you were sort of very big on sort of going and sort of meeting the parents and getting a good understanding of, of a player's background. I mean, just how key was that for you yeah. as, a, as a scout to understand think, the players you're bringing in and, and sort of how far would you sort of yeah, encourage that sort of the coaches as well should be buying into that relationship as much as possible? Well, I think it's vital. I mean, the uh, the family, you know, play a massive support uh, network uh, to any player. And in, in the sort of times that we're in at the moment, there is numerous uh, young children, you know, one parent families. Um, I mean, Marcus Rashford has been a, a great ambassador in this recent uh, week or two. Um, Melanie, his mum, I've known her for a long, long time, and Dwayne, who looks after him, his brother. They, they were a typical um, family who, you know, was suffering under hardship um, and had we not have known that about Marcus from very early days that could have been something that went undetected you know unnoticed but I always say to the scout the scout is the focal point of the club regardless of what anybody thinks they are the first people you know that sort of give the information through to uh, to the club to identify the players so I, I always said to them, it's always right. And we had it as part of our induction process that when any, when any player came into the club, the scout always had to be representing him, you know, and be there um, initially. So th there was always that contact, you know, from, uh, from grassroots all the way through. And when you, when you consider the, the sort of lifestyle that some of these lads lead, you know, they don't all come from middle-class families. Some of them come from uh, very poor sort of working back backgrounds and consequently you have to give them every uh, opportunity you know to to prove the, the the sort of value to the club and in doing that we made sure that th there were very few players in in the time that I were there um, I can put hand on heart that we had very very few problems with very few and consequently I think it's just because of the understanding that we now have uh, the the in-depth understanding, I think it's best to say that, um, and the, the roles that the people play within the club that extracts all of that relevant information that we need, you know, to support them, whether that be educational, whether it be uh, family orientated, whether it be in accommodation, transportation, um, remuneration, it, it, it's all there, you know, and uh, hopefully the clubs, you know, that are represented on here today um, are all doing them things, you know, as we always do. Just on that, Derek, I think it's a, I mean, a really, really important point. Our, I'm always amazed at the amount that our recruitment team know about, you know, the, the young boys and their families. They, they put so much pride into getting to know them um, and representing our club properly. And it's, um, it's, it's something that's hugely valuable to us. Um, and I think the, one of the other learnings that we've taken from this experience is, is, is clearly the use of technology. So the scouts put loads of effort into that face-to-face -face contact, that initial contact with the parents. They stay in contact through the trial period. You know, if it, if, even if it's not successful, they might still keep in contact if, if they've moved on elsewhere. And I think what this experience has taught us is that it's really easy now to speak to people. Um, there, there isn't as much, there can't be an excuse if I wasn't available. I mean, I didn't think 
six months ago, if you'd have told me that I was sending out uh, academy updates via video messages on WhatsApp to parents and there being that interaction, I'd have said you were mad. But yeah. that's where we're at now. And it's just meant that the communication's been so much more frequent and that has helped us to get to know the players but I hope as well that is hope the parents to get to know us as well as a club and as people within the club so that when we do go back uh, those relationships have been developed and we can continue to cultivate them through the use of technology yeah, yeah. absolutely I mean uh, on that Peter um, sort of during your time with with West Brom you feel that you're sort of one that your family was uh, yeah, hugely involved in your, your time there and uh, the club kind of understood you, one, as an individual and, and also yeah, as an athlete. Yeah, I think um, my parents had a good relationship with like the scouts that got me in, like um, Alex said. And um, I had a good relationship with the coaches as well. We used to have the, obviously the six-week review, six-month reviews with all the academy coaches up to the age of 16. But I say once the scholarship started, uh, your parents lose contact with them as much because you turn into a man. You you get told all the information. You get you take more ownership. So yeah, your parents are not nowhere near as involved as much. But um, yeah, that's it really. And, and for you, Sam, I was just about to say the same. Really, I think throughout the academy process, I mean, Derby were very good. Um, to me and my family I used to like help with transport and whatnot, um, getting me from my house, taking me to training and helping in them aspects. Um, but definitely as soon as you kind of turn to your scholarship, it turns more just to you because they want you to try and grow more as an individual really and you're not too reliant on your parents or getting the feedback from your parents that then comes to you. You, you, you kind of throw them more into more of a professional environment. So it's more on a one-to-one -one basis. Coach speaks to you instead of the coach speaking to you and your parent. Okay, I think finally, whether um, we we'll start with Alex. Um, hopefully, as information comes through and um, when when the academy season is going to restart, it's going to be more opportunities open for players. You think it's best that it's just going to be left for individual clubs to open their doors for players or is this a time where maybe as a group football needs to be a bit more creative maybe give sort of more sort of group trials or some other opportunities for for players to show show their talent at this time i think uh i think initially i mean uh, as i mentioned to you on the call during the week our focus at the moment is very much on on safety it's it, we're at that level and we, we're creating protocols to return for the under 23s and under 18s not yet got confirmed dates but we're putting the you know measures in place to ensure that we know that when we do go back we'll be able to do it in a safe manner I think for us as a club there's going to be a, a massive focus as there always has been but on coaching initially and coaching the players that are in the building um, but there is clearly a, a large pool of players that are going to be looking for clubs and I think I'm not sure um, as, a, as a club there'll be anything revolutionary in the way in which those players are recruited I think the channels will still be very similar um, but I, I definitely don't think it should be something that should, shouldn't should be on the discussion table for, um, for everyone in terms of the governing bodies to get together I mean there are exit trials but um, I know there's limit, you know, limited in my experience there's been limited success um, because it's such an intense uh, in, intense period and uh, you can go to them and there's, there's lots of players you can struggle to be played in your favourite position. You're judged on, you know, a couple of halves of football with a team that you've never played with. It's it's a challenge. So I definitely think there should be a, a discussion around are there other ways in which that can be enhanced uh, to help the likes of Sam and Peter that are on this call for sure. Um, do you have any sort of thoughts, any ideas, any sort of creative things, clubs? as a group could be doing on that, Derek? Well, I think Alex has hit the nail on the head, to be truthful, because I don't think anybody at this moment in time would be prepared, you know, to take a gamble on anything uh, until we see some stability. And like, uh, like Alex said, I think the safety aspect of it is, you know, is the major uh, sort of, 
forefront runner here. I think what, what happens is in Sam and uh, Peter's case, it's going to be a case of that the, the people that are representing them will probably be doing the hardest, you know, to try and literally get hold of any member of recruitment staff at this moment in time. Um, and I don't think anything will come back to normality until the season finally gets underway. All of the precautionary measures are taken, you know, for uh, for the safety of the players, the boys, you know, the staff, etc., etc. Um, and then, you know, it will be debated as to what the requirements will be of the individual clubs. Uh, because certainly there's going to be a void now for, for a 12-month period. You know, for the, the 18s and some of the 23s, you know, that are being released, um, there will be, you know, requirements from clubs. At this moment, nobody knows what they're going to be. Um, but certainly from a point of view of the lads themselves, what do they have to look forward to? There are opportunities out there. Um, it may not be in the UK, like you know, like uh, Sam has already muted about the scholarships in uh, America. It might be something that they have to seriously consider. The agents will be tirelessly trying to work abroad, you know, to find them uh, outlets and things. Um, the exit trials that uh, Alex has mentioned, I don't think are particularly uh, the right way to go because everything's individualistic there. All the lads are trying to promote themselves as such. They don't get any team orientation. You know, it's very, very much a case of, uh, you know, 11 strangers being put on a pitch together. So I don't think it's conducive to, uh, to them producing the right sort of uh, quality of their, their own ability. So I think what we've got to do is just take this one step at a time. I don't think anybody can project too far at this moment in time into, uh, into the coming months. But from the boys' point of view, and I keep stressing it, and I will keep stressing it, they've got to stay positive because this thing will turn around at some point. You know, and the, the members of staff that are, are in post at the moment hopefully will still be in post when, you know, when they come out of furlough and then things will slowly and gradually get back to, uh, to what we know. Sarah, um, well, if you've put Sam and Peter on the on the spot a couple of times today, we'll put you on the spot now. Um, Fair enough. Obviously, yeah, fingers fingers crossed. At some point, Sam and, and Peter will have an opportunity at a club, either sort of to go on trial or or start training. I mean, what, from a sort of performance psychology point of view, how what sort of advice would you give them in terms of preparing preparing for that that sort of first sort of few days, first week? sort of going into a new club where you're really sort of trying hard to make an impression. Yeah, I would say actually both Sam and Peter have already um, alluded tonight to, to staying in the present moment and actually given the current situation, it's for emotional well-being, it, one of the, the safest and, and one of the most, um, the best places to be is actually to be connecting with the present and to not spend lots of time thinking about, okay, well, you know, when this happens, or I don't know when this happens. Uh, and if you find yourself in the kind of the negative end of, well, I don't know when I'm going to get a try. I don't know when I'm going to get an opportunity. You need to bring yourself back to connecting with the here and now and the today and connecting with, well, what it is that, what am I doing today that is actually just going to give me that, that little bit of edge, that little bit of something when I do go, go for that opportunity rather than focusing on the negative of, I don't know when that opportunity is coming. Um, actually, what are you doing each day? Each day, little thing, it could be something social, maintain a social connection, maintain a physical connection every day to these little things. Um, so that when that time does come, you will be in the best possible position and your emotional well being will be really stable, really strong, um, and you'll be ready to go rather than pinning everything on an unknown because at the moment it's unknown. And in terms of that, Sam, I know you getting a, a job has kind of helped you massively in terms of staying staying in the moment. Um, yeah. So that, yeah, you're not thinking too far ahead. You gives you something to focus on day by day. Well, exactly. Yeah. That's just it's kind of why I got it really because I didn't want to just be my mind just to be focused on football. Football. I know myself. I want to be in a year's time back in a professional environment of playing football each day. But for now, I just needed something that would keep my mind off football 24-7 because sometimes it can get a bit negative sat down on yourself. So the whole reason for getting a job was to just take each day, as you say, as it comes. Once I've finished work, then I can do my one-to-one -one session or do another thing that will help me. So when my time does come to get the trial or go back in somewhere, I know I'm 100% ready for it. 
with you, Peter, is sort of things that you're doing at the moment that are sort of helping you to, as Sarah say, stay stay in the moment, not look too far ahead. Yes, like I said, I've got a schedule to keep myself um, focused and not just messing around all the time. Like I've mentioned as well, I've been trying to get better at golf, which keeps me occupied as well, which is, a, which is quite hard. And um, yeah, speaking so I, to the psychologist at West Brom, and they said to get a DBS check done, just for like any, in case you apply for any jobs, it's always good to have one. So I just had that certificate back uh, the other day. So it's good to know that I haven't been uh, robbing banks or anything. Mm-hmm. Got a clear DBS check. So yeah, just keep to a schedule and just trying to stay focused, like I said before, yeah. And what's come out of both of your answers is that it's just about knowing ourselves and what's right for us. And, and the same for not just players, but start, you know, I've found out a lot about myself in lockdown and what works for me and what keeps me going and keeps me motivated. And it's the same for you boys. It's, it's finding what works for you. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yes, Sarah, you've led us in perfectly then to the, the final question and it's kind of be in terms of all of your own personal CPDs over the last couple of months. Um, we'll start with, with Peter. And, um, since you've, you've been released, what are the sort of big things that you've learned about yourself? I think, um, <laughs> uh, it's made me realise how much I want to be a footballer. It's made me realise that I want all this effort that I've done over the years. My parents driving me to training, picking me up, driving me to matches, feeding me. I want it all to pay off. And it's like, it does make you step back and look at the, the bigger picture and make you realise that how much you want to be a footballer, especially with the Premier League just coming back on the tellies as well. Even though it's not the same about any fans, it makes you think, oh, I want to be there. And yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Sarah, for, for yourself, you said, yeah, it's been a, yeah, an interesting period for yourself. Yeah, definitely. I think I've, um, I've actually done a lot more mindfulness. So my background is performance and I played to a decent-ish level myself. So I've always been very performance driven and I've never necessarily given myself enough time and space to actually understand that it's not about clearing your head and mindfulness isn't about, you know, in a Buddha position with, with weird new whale music. Um, although I quite like the whale music. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, just that, that understanding, you know what, negative thoughts come in and just like clouds, they come in and they go. And there's nothing we can do to stop them coming in. And the more we accept them and actually realise they'll pass, the better we feel. And um, I've probably got to grips with that in lockdown more than ever. All right, great. Uh, Alex, you said obviously it's been a, a big, a big challenge for you at QPR with staff furloughed as well. Um, what has that sort of enabled you to sort of learn about yourself? What have you taken from the last sort of two to three months? Um, I'd say it's focused a lot on technology, mainly for me and my job. Um, trying to communicate with as as many people um, in different ways as I can. So, um, pin hosting. Uh, hosting webinars with uh, first team players and director of football and, and first team manager, for example, and then sort of almost uh, doing your role, Steve, really, and trying to sort of um, include the questions that the, the boys are sending in remotely from home and then uh, trying to test myself on the technology and calling them up so they can become panellists and get an interaction going. So um, I think what I've learned is there's been, uh, you know, a huge barrier, a physical barrier put up um, at the club because there's needed to be to, to keep everyone safe but actually I think we've we as a group of staff who have, have kind of maintained working have, have broken some barriers down between sort of the link between the first first team and the academy so I'm hoping that long may that continue and we'll come up with uh, ways of, of working with those that are definitely more creative and technological than me to keep that going when we're back. Excellent, excellent. Um, Derek, I was a a lot of experiences you've had in, in football, but like I say, you've never experienced anything like this. Um, no. What have been the big lessons for you in the last couple of months? It's been, it's been very enlightening, let me put it that way. Um, I think what I've gained out of this more than anything, I've got a nine-year-old daughter who's proved to me that she's miles better on PowerPoint than I am, um, <laughs> even though I'm, I'm pretty good. But um, no, I think it's getting the people that I'm close to in relationship to the people that work for Omnisport, the members of staff to take ownership 
you know what I mean, and, and understand, um, like we've said, in these times, nobody's been here before. We're all testing the waters as such, but they still have to take ownership of their own sort of uh, destiny, so to speak. Um, and they can't just sit around moping. I'm, I'm never been a, a, a negative person. I'm always positive, you know, and I'm for sure there is something really positive going to come out of all of this. You know, so from my point of view and from the lads' point of view, what I would say to them is, yesterday's gone, you can't change that. We can change everything going forward. You know what I mean? So if they stay in that positive mindset, then there will be changes that are going to come in their lives. You know what I mean? Whether it be uh, initially wholeheartedly what they want or whether it will only be a proportion of what they want. But uh, ultimately, you know, we're, we're all going to come out of this wiser, um, I think the one thing I have gained is that I've got a lot more tolerance, you know, for uh, for children around me. Um, not saying that I didn't have before. I mean, I've had some of the, the best players you can imagine, you know, and I've been sat in uh, dressing room environments with them. But um, it, it's it's where the people realise that they have got to show a little bit more tolerance, you know, to the people that don't have the same positivity as yourself. I'm going to take that. that bit of positivity from you, Derek, and uh, pass it on to Sam with a final question, Sam. Um, so it's been uh, a challenge for yourself since of being released by Shrewsbury, but what have you sort of learnt on a personal level in the last couple of months? Um, I think just like Peter, really, you kind of realise um, how much you actually want to stay in football and how much of a drive you've really got for yourself, because as much as you say, when you're in the position of you are a scholar or you're a 23s player, you want to say you want to make it as a footballer, but then when you you don't be given a contract and you just you're left to go and fend for yourself, really, you could easily just say, "Oh, this isn't for me now. Like, I've given it my best shot, but now I've got nothing. You know, I'm I'm ready to give up." But it's proven to me how much as soon as this is all over and um, as soon as clubs try and get back to normality, how much I really want to get back into the football inside and how much I'm doing now just to get ready for when I do get that chance, really. Thanks, Sam. Well, on that note, I'd like to say, yeah, a big thank you to each and all of you. So thanks a lot, Sam, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Derek, thanks a lot for your, for your input. Thank you, Stephen. Pleasure. Anytime. <laughs> Alex, thanks uh, for sharing your experiences at QPR. Thanks, uh, thanks for the opportunity and boys just wanted to say I've been really taken aback with uh, with how positive you have been about this situation so um, really glad to hear that you're making making sort of uh, plans for the future and uh, in such a short space of time having got that news so hats off to you. Cheers Ali. Uh, and on that one I'd like to say uh, a big thank you to, to Pete, Peter Taylor. Cheers Steve, cheers to the opportunity. So no, welcome, my, my pleasure and Finally, Sarah Murray, thanks for, thanks for joining us. Thanks very much. And yeah, I'll, I'll echo what Alex said, you know, lads, Sam, Peter. Um, yeah, you're, all, you're doing everything you can right now and uh, your journey is far from over. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, just, uh, now I'll just say thank you for everyone for, for joining us on the call this evening, all the uh, attendees who've added their, their questions. And... Just to mention that, yeah, we'll be back here at six o'clock next week where we'll be talking about the importance of coaching scanning. So on that note, thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers, Alex. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Take Cheers. care, everyone. Take care. Bye now.